Francis, thank you so much for making it for the second time, supporting our community, the community of innovators. Uh, as I just mentioned, um, your tweet was very transformative for many founders in tech specifically, just like myself when I moved here in Miami. I moved here for the tweet, but I stayed for the community. My question is, what would be, the, you think, the next big thing that Florida and Miami will attract even more talent? Well, I was going to say Leo Messi, but um, <laughs> yesterday's news was that uh, Jeff Bezos was confirming that he was moving to Miami. So there you go. Uh, I don't know. If I you guys thought you, saw that. you would mention that uh, SBF was uh, guilty. No. <laughs> now it's guilty. <laughs> No, look, I, I, um, I think when you have someone like Leo Messi or you have someone like Jeff Bezos, who are people that could literally live anywhere in the world and are literally doing their due diligence on where they want to live, understanding that at that level, at their level, at the Leo Messi level, at the Jeff Bezos level, their most precious asset is not the marginal dollar in their bank account. Their most precious asset is their most finite asset, which we all share with them, by the way, which is time. And so when you think about how do you allocate your time, that limited resource that you have, when you have the ability to allocate it in any way that you want to, essentially, because you have no other limitations, then uh, it becomes interesting when people at that level are picking Miami over every other place on the planet, over Saudi, uh, over uh, Barcelona in Spain in terms of Leo, in terms of Jeff. I mean, anywhere in the world he could live and he's decided he wants to live with his family here in Miami. So I think what that means is that the ecosystem that we're creating, the community that you mentioned that we're creating is a community that values your most precious asset, which is your time, meaning that we want to give you the best return on your time. We want to make sure that if you live in our community, you're safe. We want to make sure that if you live in our community, you have an opportunity to prosper. We want to make sure that if you live in our community, you have cultural uh, activities that you can do that are going to enrich your soul or public spaces that you can visit uh, that are going to make you feel at peace, right? We want to create the best ecosystem. Um, I, I've been toying with this, you know, in the charter of the city, my, my title is chief executive officer, but, you know, I, I've been thinking about changing it to chief ecosystem officer. Because I think chief executive officer means you're running a company, which, which we are. We're running a billion and a half dollar company with 4,500 employees and four labor unions. But we're running, we're doing something much more than that. We're trying to create an ecosystem, a community, right? Which is what keeps people here. Um, the tweet attracted people because it was such a counter narrative to what was happening in America at the time. But the community, like you said, is what keeps people here. The ecosystem is what attracts people and keeps people here. So. Um, I was born here. I'm the first mayor of Miami in the history of Miami that was born in the city of Miami, which I think is a wonderful evolution for our city. But it also means that I'm fundamentally tied to my city. I'm, I'm inextricably connected to the soul of my city. And so that's what guides me every single day in the limited time that I have to serve all of you, my, my bosses. Woo. Definitely, definitely. We need big applause here. Uh, as I mentioned, the ecosystem and the community is really powerful thing to people to stick to the location they move because many of uh, us moved here also because of the crypto ecosystem growing here. And then, of course, with the crypto winter, you would expect uh, many of those entrepreneurs to leave both the industry and the state, but it's not happening, fortunately. Given your presidential experience, what do you think now about the regulation in America, both in AI and crypto? Do you have a new perspective? Have you learned something that we need to change in America to pursue this innovation and not let Saudi or yeah. China or other states to win? This, was, this answer is going to get me in trouble. We need to change our leaders. And, and specifically, yeah... And specifically, there's a generational issue. When you talk about some of these other places that you mentioned across the world, you see that their leadership has already changed from the boomer generation to the next generation, right? Uh, 
And, and with that, and I saw this in, in, in my city, in, in Miami, I took over for a last generation mayor and you get a 30 to 40 year process improvement overnight. It's the only time that happens. The only time that a country or a city or an ecosystem gets that kind of process improvement overnight or immediately is when you have a generational change because you are literally going from 30 years of experiences to 30 years earlier of experiences. My son is nine years old. I'm 46. My son can do things that I cannot do. He understands things that I do not understand. You know, he, he games, he's in these worlds, and he understands their sophistications in ways that I can't even fathom. That's not a disrespect to me. I don't take that personal. I don't get offended by that. I actually, I'm actually proud of him, right? I'm proud of the fact that his generation is already embarking on a journey that is disconnected from mine. That's advancement. That's, that's progress. And, and, and I expect there to be a day, hopefully not in the too distant future, when I can pass that baton to him and his generation and say, okay, you guys are in charge now. You guys lead the way. But when you talk about generational technology like AI and blockchain and crypto, decentralized finance, fractionalized ownership, um, you know, cryptocurrencies that are not tethered to, um, to fiat currencies, all those concepts are this generation concepts. And you're not going to have, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, you're not going to have intelligent regulation of concepts that people do not understand. For you to regulate something intelligently, you first have to understand it. And that is generational, unfortunately. And my dad is a really smart guy. He has two graduate degrees from Harvard. He's an engineer, um, you know, uh, really smart. And he struggles with it. And he's 74, again. Brilliant guy, probably the smartest person that I know, significantly more intelligent than I am, way more intelligent than I am, than I will ever be. And yet there are concepts that I can grasp easier simply because I grew up with them uh, and I'm not bound by certain concepts. Like the concept of fiat is a concept that his generation grew up with. They cannot, I don't think they can fathom a world outside of that. Just like before that was the gold standard, right? The fact that there may be a currency in the future that is not tethered to a particular country is not particularly foreign to me. It doesn't, it's not like a weird concept. It's a particularly normal concept. It just is very, very strange to the prior generation. They, they feel a loss of power. They feel a loss of, and, and from my perspective, I feel a sense of empowerment, which is interesting that, that there is that dynamic. So, um, and, 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 it, and it almost falls completely on, on generational lines when I talk to people who really talk about the prominence of the dollar and dollar, dollar dominance and why it's so important for the United States. Uh, to continue to have the dominant currency in the world. And for me, I think it's more important for the U.S. to have the dominant economy of the world, not necessarily the dominant currency of the world. I think currency can is just a means of exchange. It can be anything. And I think the, the, the less human intervention that there is, the better, uh, because you're seeing human intervention in currencies and in budgets be a very highly manip manipulative factor that creates oftentimes more detriments than it creates benefits, in my opinion. Speaking of generational change, uh, in 2021, 10% of home buyers utilize cryptocurrency for their down payments. And of course, we're speaking about the new generation here. And I agree with you that in the leadership, uh, at the head of the United States innovation, we should have those leaders understanding the new generation, listening to the new generation, data-driven, number-driven, just like you are. You always speak facts and numbers, and we definitely appreciate it because you're leading your endeavors as a chief executive officer of a startup or as a, as a chief ecosystem startup. Um, since you touched upon the cryptocurrency um, uh, being the new norm, and we don't have to be tied to fiat or national currencies. We're seeing now that El Salvador and Taiwan are legalizing Bitcoin as a legal tender. We're also seeing that potentially the U.S. government will finally approve the Bitcoin ETFs. It's coming by the end of the year, uh, the latest uh, in January. What do, you, what do you expect in terms of trends in 2024, short term, but also long term, where the cryptocurrency and blockchain innovation is going to well you can count me in the 10 percent first of all that have bought a property with um crypto as a down payment um yes Woo! 
I, I announced that, I think, at the last Bitcoin conference. Um, and you still receive your salary partly in Bitcoin? I, I do not anymore uh, receive my salary in Bitcoin, only because I, when I took out that mortgage, it triggered my uh, direct payments. Gotcha. So I but, to, but you bought I, the house cor utilizing correct, cryptocurrency. Correct. So Here you go. Mo Ooh. Most most of it is is in that purchase. But but th th that was what I wanted to do, which was take it to the next level. So say, look, how do I create a, another use case? Right, I'm getting paid in, in Bitcoin. I can use it, um, and how can I how can I make it more functional? So I got a, a mortgage on a property, an investment property that I bought with a down payment in crypto, um, in Bitcoin actually, and so I think that is demonstrating the stability of Bitcoin. It's demonstrating uh, the marketability of Bitcoin, and it's demonstrating the utility of Bitcoin. And so I think that's part of it. I think the biggest issue we have right now. Uh, and it's not just a, 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 a crypto issue, although crypto, because of the news that you, some of the news that you referenced, is struggling a little bit. It's it's really that the the, the um, venture capital pipeline has dried up, right? And so it's not just Bitcoin per se or a, a, a blockchain. It's it's a, it's a general drying up of of, of the uh, VC pipeline, and a lot of it, by the way, has gone to artificial intelligence. But if you look at Artificial intelligence is a great um, metaphor for Bitcoin or for or for crypto or for blockchain because if if you think about it, artificial intelligence right now is 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 the hot thing. It's what everybody's investing in. It's what everyone believes is going to transform the world, and it will. But it's been around since the 1980s, and people don't remember that it took 40 years for artificial intelligence to become intelligent, <laughs> right? To have the the certain level of functionality. That it has now so that it can actually give back to us in the form of actionable help now the fear of course is that it will go crazy right that it will that it will give that it will be so powerful that it will it will overwhelm us the most interesting thing that i've learned about artificial intelligence and i go back to to, to crypto is that it's constrained by energy and i would have never necessarily maybe unintelligently put one thing together with the other but the most sophisticated AI technology right now is not going to be available until the energy that it's needed to power it is first available. So it, it, it's an interesting correlation that I did not know existed. So that's another barrier uh, there. But, and by the way, there are countries that are figuring it out, right? And that will figure it out uh, by the time that technology I think is available in the next five to 10 years, generative uh, AI. But in, on, on, on blockchain, I, I just think we're, we're going to be, with every bear market or every winter, as you called it, um, it's, it's really kind of a, a, I hate to say this, but it's a little bit of a Darwinian process where the strong survive, the companies that are actually revenue driven, the companies that have great technology and that are, it's not just a great idea, but it's actually a great, um, you know, executable, uh, executed idea. Um, are the ones that are going to survive. I mean, I think what happens in when you have a, whether it's in the internet bubble or in this latest um, money creation bubble, where you have kind of like what Alan Greenspan would call irrational exuberance, right? Where you have uh, people chasing ideas as opposed to chasing companies that are based on the more, more fundamentals. When that money retreats, all that happens is you go back to the fundamentals, right? Which is revenue, you know, revenue, profit, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, which is kind of funny because for most people, it should always be about the fundamentals. Uh, fantastic. I think uh, that we have already observed two crypto winters or three crypto winters and two bull runs. Now we're observing the first uh, AI bull run. So maybe both of those transformative technologies will go in cycles uh, from now on. Uh, we actually will have Kathy Wood later today speaking about those both platforms as the next uh, most transformative uh, technologies of the future. Uh, I'd like uh, the audience to also have a chance to ask uh, a question for the Mayor Soros here. So if you have a question, please uh, come over. I will give you a mic. Uh, uh, Mayor Soros, what do you think will be impact of AI over cities and governance? I think it's going to be massive um, when you think about a lot of the decisions that are made, particularly in our planning department, our zoning department, our permitting department. Um, those are very re are often repetitive. 
um, human constrained, bottleneck constrained decision making. Our employees, government employees, typically work from nine to five. We don't have the same ability to give them incentives and bonuses that you do in the private sector. Um, you know, to raise their salaries in con you know conformity with the market or their pipeline or whatever. So it just it's harder for us to be flexible. What I believe will happen in 10 years or less is that those three or four departments that I mentioned will all be predominantly driven by AI. Um, and what they'll do is the, a computer will aggregate all the decisions that were made for the last 10 or 15 years, which probably encompasses 98, 99% of all the decisions that are needed to be made. And you'll have you'll have that readily available and so you'll cut down response time and expense probably my guess is at least 80 percent on each factor 80 percent cost reduction 80 percent time reduction whenever you have a disruption of that size it's massive and there's no one if if any client ever comes to you or someone's pitching you a product and says to you i can save you 80 percent of your cost and 80 percent of the time there isn't a human being on this planet that will say no to that. There just isn't. So I think that's a massive disruption that will happen in the next 10 years in government across the country. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, David Soto's here. Nice talking to you. It's, a, it's an honor. It's an honor, Mike. I wanted to ask, uh, what are your next three moves to implementing AI within the state? The next three moves? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think like one of the mistakes that happened with crypto was there wasn't regulation in place. So I would advocate for, you know, responsible regulation doesn't stifle innovation. So there's a delicate balance between regulation that protects consumers and protects the public at large versus regulation that stifles innovation. And people say, you know what, we're not going to innovate here. We're going to go somewhere else. So I think that is a very delicate balance that has to be uh, number one. I think number two is it's talent driven. So I think um, I would love to see, maybe, I don't know if I can accomplish it in the next two years, which is what I have left on my term, but I'd like to see at least an announcement or an advancement where we're creating the best technical school in the world here in Miami to train AI engineers, right? That would That's be amazing. a dream. And, we're talking to people about it. So it's not completely in the realm of fic fiction, right? And number three, I would say um, there's, you know, we, we talk about AI in, as an abstract concept, but I've learned that it's very physical in the sense that it requires significant computing power and significant energy, right? These are physical constraints. So we obviously want to have the infrastructure to make sure that AI can grow and we can lead in that in that realm thank you speaking of attracting talent uh there will be another huge conference happening in april emerge americas launched by melissa medina and it will be the fifth anniversary of this conference that normally has uh, attracted over twenty thousand people also, uh, last week, we had ETH Miami Hackathon with leading engineers in blockchain coming here with AI tracks. So we're attracting AI engineers as well. And more and more hackathons are happening in Miami. And we always appreciate your help being at the conferences like this one, coming, talking to the community, hearing about the ideas. So we have one, I think, one or two more questions. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, do two. Hi, Mr. Suarez. My name is Hi. Zed Castro. Hi, sir. And I have a very quick question. On your opinion, realistically speaking, how do you see the real estate market in the Dade County in the next 15 years? 15 years. Um, are you from Brazil? Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, so here's the way I would say it. We um, an analysis of our zoning code. So we have what's called a form-based zoning code, meaning in every building, including this one, there are invisible boxes, invisible boxes that stand on top of those buildings. So the building that we're in right now, the Hyatt, 
we just did a deal with a developer. This building is coming down. Not right now. And hope not. Yeah. And in its place will we'll, we'll be a large development with a lot of com, you know, com, uh, common area space, park space, et cetera. So um, that, that, that analysis has yielded us a number. The number is 10. 10x. So we have the ability to grow 10 times larger than what we are right now without changing a thing, without changing those invisible boxes. So every time a building like this goes down, a larger one goes up in its place. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So my prognosis for the city in the next 15 years is if we follow the three rules that I've articulated, which I think are very simple, keep taxes low. We lower taxes to the lowest level in history. We grew 14% last year. Keep people safe. If the year were to end today, we would have the lowest homicide rate in the history, in recorded history of Miami this year. Okay? Very good job. And lean into innovation, which is part three. Create high-paying jobs. Try to help people become prosperous, whether it's through education, whether it's through living, uh, you know, in affordable housing, transportation, etc. Give people an opportunity to be successful. If you follow those three simple rules and you have a 10x growth envelope my prediction for the next 15 years is that miami will be one of the most significant cities in the world that's my my hope and safest also for sure thank you sir thank you pleasure to speak to you my name is austin Murata. hey how are you doing a question for you yeah. uh being that <clears throat> excuse me being that you utilized bitcoin in a transaction which was made to uh, present the opportunity to all of Florida and Miami. How do you see yourself uh, maybe advertising the use of Bitcoin in future transactions uh, to get the state more accustomed and adapted to the concept of it, which translates to buyers and sellers being more comfortable? I, I, think, I think we've done a lot, you know, our city. You know, we've, we were the first ones uh, to put the Satoshi's white paper on our website mm -hmm. in, I think, the world. Um, we were the first ones to allow for our employees to be paid in Bitcoin through strike, um, which is how I was getting paid. And then I took it a step further and bought a property with it, with the Bitcoin that I had accumulated, right? To just go another step. Um, I, I think that the city as a government has done a lot. I think now it's up to the private sector, really. I think the private sector has to... Um, start delivering on some of the technologies that we know exist and just have to be put into practice at scale. For example, um, you, you, every single restaurant right now or every single consumer uh, point, point of sale place, everyone should be able to take Bitcoin. Every single one, right? You should be able to have your credit card. And I think at some point in the near future, banks will, you'll be able to have your your bank account, like, you know, and you'll be able to choose, hey, this will be your Bitcoin card, this will be your debit card or whatever, and you can just pay at a point of sale. So that's functionality at, at scale in consumer purchases. Um, I also like to see um, soon, and I know it's happening, fractionalization, right? When you, when you talk about fractionalization, this building that we're talking about, this, you know, this new Hyatt that's going to come in its place, it's going to be financed with two different things, debt and equity. That's it, right? A bank loan and equity where people who are risking their capital to diminish the debt to equity ratio so that the banks have a safe loan. That's how you finance every building in, you know, basically in the world, right? But we've seen through crowdfunding and we've seen through fractionalization that it would be wonderful if someone who lives in an impoverished area could invest $1,000 in the debt of this building because they're going to get a better return than if they put their money potentially in a CD or in a savings account. And if there's liquidity, they can also trade out of that position as well. So they're not stuck for the 30 years or 40 years or 50 years that the loan matures. So I think that's all going to happen. I think it's really up to the private sector now. We will continue to try to be uh, supportive and legislate in ways, like I said, that balance um innovation with innovation we don't want to we don't want to get out of balance one way or the other right not to 
not too pro regulation and then you stifle innovation and not too light on the regulation and then you have you know a situation like what we're seeing right now um that, that just unfolded Thank so you. we'll have one more question uh, but before that speaking of speaking of the private sector this is the room to meet the doers in the private sectors we'll have a pitch competition shortly with seven VCs backing prop tech startups doing stuff in AI and blockchain. Propy is doing title for transactions in Bitcoin and not only. How many crypto certified agents are in the room? Here you go. All those agents know how to accept cryptocurrency in real estate. We have 3,000 agents that are certified. They know how to NFT home, how to accept cryptocurrency in their transactions, how to close the title. And during the pitch competition, we have two companies doing fractional ownership. So we can sell this building in fractions and tokens. We'll have one company that is building mortgage on crypto, uh, on blockchain. Now, one last question. Hi, Mayor Suarez. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for your comments, your Thank thoughtful you. leadership of, of Miami. Um, I have a hypothetical. If if you were if you were a single issue voter and your issue was Web3 crypto advancement in Miami, who would you endorse for president? I hate hypotheticals. Ooh. <laughs> um if I was a single issue voter and I can tell you who I wouldn't endorse for president. <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I'll tell you this. I'm, I'm surprised at some level and saddened at some level that I don't think there's anyone that's really emerged as that single issue voter candidate that I can come up with. Because um, I haven't really heard anyone talk at depth about Web3 or crypto um, in, the, in the field, to be honest. Um, there's a couple of people that have taken some pretty, what I would consider safe positions, like saying they're against central bank digital currencies. I mean, who is in favor of that? We know who you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, uh, nobody's in favor of that. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I don't know anybody. If there are some, maybe some people are in favor of it. Um, it's 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 a scary proposition because you don't want a central government to have like a ledger of what everybody has at any given moment. So that's the big problem with that. And I don't know that. You can never overcome that in terms of people feeling that that could be done anonymously, right? So I think that's a really basic position. I haven't seen anybody take any risky positions on it. Um, I think part of the issue is particularly what Natalie said at the beginning, which is as the campaign started, you had a crypto winner and some controversy happening. So if the election would have taken two place two years ago, I promise you, you would have three or four candidates right now vying to be the most pro-crypto presidential candidate. But because of the controversy, you know, we we try to avoid, as elected officials, we avoid it like a virus, right, to the extent that we can, when we can, right? Because um, we want to be liked fundamentally. I mean, I think at the basic level, you serve because you want to do good and you want people to like the fact that you're doing good for them on their behalf. So you try to get away from things that, people are, are not happy about in a given moment. Uh, unless you're someone like me that's like a true believer, very passionate, and believes despite the moment that these are technologies that are here forever for me, right? And so it's just a matter of getting through some of the, the difficulties, that, which, which as, as she said, there have been multiple booms and busts, right? And, and we've seen that throughout the entire course of Bitcoin, for example, or, or, or a variety of different cryptocurrencies, or even even the internet. I, I, I tell people when I was asked in national interviews a lot about, you know, what do you think about this moment and crypto and this, that, and the other, and I would say, well, I said, you know, do you remember a company called Napster? Do you remember a company called Netscape? Right? These are companies that we all were familiar with. They were the beginning of Safari and Google and they were the beginning of Apple Music and Spotify. I mean, those companies did not survive, but their technologies changed the world. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's apparent to me that all, although there are some companies that are not going to survive this moment, the technologies will change the world. On that good note, technology changing the world. Thank you so much, Mesores.